Good evening, and welcome to the Stratcom Talks. My name is Nika Alekseyeva, and tonight we will be talking about disinformation in Central and Eastern Europe. I am affiliated with Digital Forensic Research Lab, and I'm doing disinformation researcher, uh, research on a daily basis. And tonight I'm joined by two brilliant experts. Uh, first, Jakub Kalensky. He is Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab, based in Czech Republic. Uh, prior to uh, joining uh, DFR Lab, he was also involved in European Union's East Taskom um, Force, where he was responsible for EU versus disinformation campaign. And our second uh, great uh, expert here is uh, Katarina Klingova. She is Senior Research Fellow at Globsec. Globsec is a global think tank based in Bratislava that is committed to enhancing security, prosperity and sustainability in Europe and throughout the world. And prior uh, for Globsec, um, Katarina was project coordinator and researcher at the Transparency International in Slovakia. Uh, good evening, Jakub and Katarina. Hi, thanks for having us. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. So, um, Katarina's organization, Globsec, um, has annual research uh, that it, it published quite recently. It's called Globsec Trends 2020. And there are a few interesting um, conclusions, findings that I find quite striking. First, COVID-19. Only 37% of respondents would take vaccine if offered. Probably now situation has changed, but still vaccine hesitancy is quite significant issue. Second, NATO. Though most of respondents or 72% support NATO's membership, at the same time, four in 10 people uh, believe that NATO is aggressive tool by the US and that NATO is the one that is provoking Russia. And third, democracy. Though democracy is perceived as still the best way to govern countries, when it's labeled as liberal, then 41% of respondents see it as a threat. So quite interesting uh, region with interesting perspectives on, on the issues. And uh, let me give floor to Jakub to tell us a little bit more about this information in Czech Republic and um, in particular COVID disinformation. Jakub, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nika, and uh, thanks once more for, for having us. Uh, best regards to uh, all the viewers from Prague. Um, I followed the reports of the Czech Elves uh, organizations that have been, or it's an organization that has been formed uh, based on the image of similar organizations in the Baltic states. So, so it is a good, uh, opportunity to mention that uh, Baltic states are an inspiration for, for countering disinformation in the rest of Europe. And uh, when you follow the COVID-related disinformation in Czech media, it, it is fairly obvious uh, to see that it, it is directly threatening people's lives, and this is really no exaggeration. It is linked to many of the usual disinformation-oriented pro-Kremlin ecosystem uh, pseudo-media which means that it is building on, on years of experience, uh, of years of experience reaching out to people, finding the precise channels that trigger them, finding the right messages that trigger them. And this ex experience is showing uh, right as we speak. The COVID-related disinformation is violent. It is attacking the most basic emotions. It incites violence and hatred. Uh, let me underline that it is, it is extremely violent and it is in line with most of uh, the notorious Kremlin disinformation campaigns as they have been, for example, recently mentioned by the Estonian Foreign Intelligence Service, the report last week or two weeks ago. It is anti-democracy, it is causing destabilization, mistrust, disobedience, rebellion and chaos. It is attacking institutions and media, which might explain the lower credibility uh, of these institutions in our region. The attacks are both at the more strategic level, like against the EU, against the US, against the West, against some global elites, but also on a more tactical level, like particular politicians or political parties that uh, this disinformation program and ecosystem perceives as hostile. 
Uh, the only actors who are not targeted but uh, receive praise instead are Russia, China, and those actors who are supporting these two uh, dictatorships. The messages are that uh, the pandemic doesn't even exist, uh, but it was created by the US, although it doesn't exist, or it was created by the EU. Alternatively, they are responsible for the spread of the already non-existent virus. Respirators are dangerous. Uh, there are viruses in them. They cause cancer. They're dangerous, especially for kids who need a higher amount of oxygen. You would see emotionally blackmailing memes with a picture of a six month, uh, six month old, old baby in a respiratory mask that is begging its parents to stop killing him. This is really emotionally blackmailing on, on the most basic level. Testing is dangerous uh, via testing. Microchips are being implanted, most often microchips from Bill Gates, obviously. Vaccination is dangerous. It threatens people's lives. People die right after being vaccinated. It is genetic manipulation. It is dangerous, especially for seniors, for your grandfathers and grandmothers. Here we see another emotional blackmailing. It's not only about the little babies, but it's also about the vulnerable pensioners. Uh, it is a targeted genocide, uh, genocide of the government to get rid of the elderly to save money on pensions. You, you can really see that they are trying to incite hatred towards the government and towards the institutions. Um, the government allegedly intends to enforce all the measures by blackmailing and uh, by outright violence. It is part of the plan to reduce uh, population. Since uh, both of you follow the program and disinformation channels, you know about the old plan to uh, reduce population in Europe either via migration or right now via, via vaccines. Uh, the government measures are allegedly designed to lower our immunity and to increase control over population, whatever that means. COVID numbers are falsified. Doctors are getting extra money for COVID patients. They are being called white mafia that is helping the government with the genocide. And it is democracy that is responsible for this mess. And uh, the disinformation outlets are calling for a, for a leader who will lead the nation out of it and attack the government institutions. There are even calls for violent attacks against the government representatives, uh, including death threats, actually. And um, there is one uh, obviously fake interview of Putin uh, for an Italian TV where he is allegedly warning Europe, uh, I know about your Satanist plans uh, around the vaccine, which uh, is already delusional. But after outlining all the disinformation narratives, you, you might see wh where it's coming from. Once again, the campaign we see is multidimensional. Uh, you would see the same narratives being spread in discussion forums under solid media articles via chain emails, via social media. They get parroted by the notorious disinformation-oriented pro-Kremlin actors with access to the mainstream media, be it uh, politicians or, or celebrities. And it is evolving rapidly. When the government announced that people are obliged to wear respiratory masks instead of more basic masks, uh, they adapted the narrative. Uh, when there is news about a new mutation, the disinformation ecosystem rapidly adapts again and they start spreading new messages like that the new mutation, mutation was uh, artificially created and it contains HIV virus. This orchestration of multiple sources and this rapid reaction that clearly indicates that there is some level of organizational structure, this is impossible to achieve organically. <laughs> not even the government, which is trying to have some communication campaign, not even the government is so organized and so persuasive in their communication. So, so you can clearly see that there is someone behind that, although we obviously have no smoking gun. Uh, but yeah, let me just end with, uh, with uh, underlining that it is very much in line with the notoriously known Kremlin disinformation campaigns and that the only actors who are not attacked but rather praised are, are Russia, China and those who are serving their interests here in Czech Republic. Thank you, Jakub. I have... Uh a few follow-up questions just uh, to, to use the occasion while we are still on the topic. So first, uh, how big would you evaluate the campaign is if you think about all information space in Czech Republic? This is truly hard to say because we managed to monitor quite well what's happening on social media and some of these organizations managed to follow what's happening in this a uh, weird ecosystem of these disinformation-oriented websites we have around 
40 to 60 of them uh, and another few dozen in Slovakian, as, as Katka will surely mention. Uh, so we know that these might be read all together by dozens of thousands of people, but the trouble is that all this is amplified by uh, seemingly illegitimate sources who appear domestic, but in fact, they just repeat uh, foreign disinformation, which in the case of Czech Republic is, for example, the president Miloš Zeman. And once uh, the president says something, obviously even the mainstream media have to report it. So suddenly you have foreign originated disinformation penetrating a solid media outlet. And there it's already almost impossible to measure uh, how, how big the impact is. So, so this is truly hard to say um, the, um, the Facebook groups, for example, that get monitored, and let me outline, this is just a small part of the disinformation campaign. They have a following in like high dozens of thousands or low hundreds of thousands in a 10 million country. The chain emails, they presumably manage to reach about low hundreds of thousands of people per week. But these are just estimates. Unfortunately, we don't have precise numbers for the chain emails. Hmm. And is it all in a Czech language or is it mostly dominated by Russian or any other language? No, no, no. Uh, I mean, you, you would receive it translated. Some, sometimes the uh, pseudo-media admit that it was translated from Russia Today or Sputnik. Sometimes it's translated from a proxy that is uh, seemingly in English, but it basically just spreads programming disinformation, something like the global research or... Infowars or similar, similar outlets. Um, some of it is even um, from sources that are like 100% Czech. Uh, on the other hand, they do not really show who is owning them, who is funding them. And the messaging they spread is exactly the same as the messaging that you would see from Sputnik. So it's kind of, we're in the situation that if it walks like a duck and looks like a duck, and if it likes the company of other ducks, it's most likely a duck. Thank you, Jakub. So uh, now let me pass the floor on to Katerina. And Katerina has more broader view, not only about Slovakia, where she's based, but uh, the whole region. So Katerina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nika. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, um, you mentioned our polling and we've been doing this polling since uh, 2016 in order to really find out how widespread our disinformation among population and uh, last year uh, our uh, pollings focused on uh, COVID-19 because it was such a huge topic and still is and we really found out that uh, in three uh, in only in three out of nine countries uh, majority of the people uh, really trusted public authorities in providing them information about COVID-19 uh, then uh, uh, on average there was uh, Thirty-eight uh, percent of respondents who thought that uh, basically public institutions were lying to them, that the official uh, numbers about the COVID-19 uh, cases in their countries were not true, and in reality the numbers were way lower. And as you mentioned um, in the beginning, in, in the introduction, um, and uh, as, as Jakub also mentioned, there have been a lot of, lot of conspiracy theories connected to uh, COVID-19 that have been uh, spread in our information uh, spaces. And a lot of, lot of people eventually believe in them. Uh, you know, uh, on average, 26% uh, of uh, Central and Eastern Europeans uh, thought that, uh, or think, still think that the U.S. was deliberately uh, created uh, virus, um, uh, you know, 24% of Central and Eastern Europeans think that COVID is fake and is a tool for manipulation. Um, and uh, this eventually, this trust or distrust uh, in uh, institutions, this distrust in uh, information provided by public institutions and belief in conspiracy theories uh, results in lower number of um, um, willingness to get vaccinated. Uh, we did this polling um, in October, we published the data in December, and we uh, really found out that majority of Central and Eastern Europeans actually were not willing to get vaccinated. Uh, you know, we, we, we're, I'm from Slovakia, Jakub is from Czech Republic, so let's talk the numbers there. Um, uh, so um, in our polling shows that 
um, only 36% of Slovaks and 35% of Czechs wanted uh, to get vaccinated and the the data really doesn't really differ uh, like differs i think that the latest polling in slovakia connected to vaccination talks about 40 percent of slovaks uh, wanting to get vaccinated against covid 19. but what is important uh, finding from our polling is that this willingness to get vaccinated significantly increases in case of slovakia by 21 percent uh, in case of uh, a Czech Republic uh, in case by 18% if people trusted public institutions. So we really uh, see that the importance of trust really plays a huge, um, a huge uh, importance uh, in, uh, in uh, getting vaccinated, in, in building the societal uh, immunity. And this is something, as Yaku pointed out, this is one of the things that has been consistently targeted by uh, various information operations um, coming from uh, both mainland countries, but also uh, being spread by various domestic um, actors. Thank you, Katerina. Domestic actors, um, how big a proportion are they who are inclined to parrot or repeat uh, these disinformation narratives that you mentioned? Um, in Slovakia, uh, we have this really nice tool called um, Bilbets Online, something like Stupid in Line would be a vague translation. Uh, and it monitors over uh, 1,800 uh, various Facebook pages and open Facebook groups that have been actively uh, spreading various disinformation or misinformations, uh, not only in Slovakia and Czech Republic. Um, we have also a database uh, of uh, disinformation websites uh, that contains uh, around 200 uh, websites that have been identified uh, as spreading conspiratorial or malign content uh, in Slovakia and Czech Republic. This is something that already um, um, Jaku mentioned a bit, but um, you know, in Slovakia, we don't need uh, Czech, we don't need Sputnik, and we don't have Sputnik because there's a Czech version of Sputnik, and this close pro, uh, proximity of uh, our nations, uh, our languages enables really smooth uh, spread of disinformation that are originating in Czech Republic uh, to get into Slovakia and influence uh, Slovak um, respondents and readers. So. Uh, you see at one point the smoothness of, of transition and flow of information. And on the other hand, you really see uh, support of these domestic uh, actors and coordination of their activities. You know, um, Slovak disinformation outlets often quote uh, various Czech politicians. Uh, and then you have various uh, common Czech and Slovak uh, groups uh, where various pro-Kremlin or other conspiracies connected to COVID-19 um, or anti-EU, anti-NATO uh, conspiracies and disinformation are being uh, spread. So, yeah, um, <laughs> there's a lot of, lot of actors that are actively involved in this uh, spread of disinformation and information operations in our countries and they're actively cooperating. And something uh, that also already uh, uh, Jakub mentioned that uh, these outlets um, and these even politicians um, are, have wider fan base and have a huge reach on social media platforms than official accounts of, for example, Ministry of uh, uh, Health or uh, other ministries or other public institutions that have been uh, actively trying to debunk uh, and counter some of these disinformation. So um, yeah, a lot of lot of actors and we have a lot of things ahead of us because uh, they just keep on multiplying and you really see, uh, for example, far-right extremist party uh, having uh, over 100 Facebook pages or Facebook groups that actively really spread um, its messages, um, you know, inciting hate uh, against Roma minority during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, spreading disinformation that 
um, respirators are, you know, limiting your ability to breathe. Um, something that was also also mentioned by by Jakub. So, um, yeah, we have a lot of actors that are actively spreading this information in both in Czech Republic and Slovakia. Okay, you're painting this image quite grim. Maybe you can name some existing initiatives that try to counter this massive disinformation flow that, well, the impression is like it's like really huge. And how effective these countermeasures are? There have been several initiatives uh, that both in Slovakia and the Czech Republic uh, that have been actively trying to uh, counter disinformation or race public awareness uh, on, uh, um, you know, the impact of disinformation. Um, and Globsec has been an active part of them. I don't know, I mean, a really good job is being done by ELFs, uh, whether Czechs or, or Slovaks. Um, and there's this initiative uh, called Konspiratory um, Bodka SK, Konspiratory.sk. It's a, um, it's an initiative of, of public, um, of PR agencies, uh, that have started to uh, label um, websites according to uh, how often do they spread uh, conspiracies uh, and um, some other mainline content. And then they offer their clients an opportunity not to eventually, um, uh, you know, promote their products, their brand on these uh, websites. Um, so they're tackling disinformation um, in a bit of a different way, you know, they're fighting disinformation where it hurts in their money because these people uh, and disinformation websites are not then getting money uh, for the advertisements. Um, there have been, um, yeah, there have been a lot of, lot of initiatives. Um, so, yeah, I mean, th these are few that I can mention, but there are plenty of more. Um, the, their impact, well, their impact is, is questionable. I mean, our polling really showed that, uh, for example, Slovakia is the most conspiracy prone country within the region. Uh, last year we did two pollings. Uh, we pulled several conspiracy theories and we found out that on average 53% of Slovaks believe in various conspiracy theories. 65% uh, of Slovaks um, thought that U.S. Um, a NATO NATO bases in Slovakia would uh, mean automatic uh, um, invasion uh, of of Slovakia. Sixty uh, percent of Slovaks uh, think that there are secret society groups uh, trying to establish totalitarian world order. Uh, over uh, fifty percent uh, of of Czechs, Hungarians, and Slovaks think that uh, recent protests. Um, public protests against the government, um, uh, you know, have been organized uh, by George Soros. So um, the initiatives are still there, but, um, and, you know, the in initiatives and actions of public institutions and various civil society organizations are effective, but you cannot really um, erase this impact of systematically spread disinformation that have been here uh, for years, you know, um, uh, just within a few months. And uh, this is something that we need to be actively working on. Thank you, Katerina. Jakub, do you know of any initiatives that are effective in Czech Republic? I, uh, I think I think Katarina mentioned actually a few, uh, and we have some similar organizations. I mentioned the reports of the Czech elves. We have uh, a brilliant think tank, European Values, uh, which is monitoring programming and disinformation. Uh, there are a few other think tanks and civil society organizations that are uh, quite active in this regard. I think it's, I think it's uh, useful to underline that uh, both in Czech Republic and in Slovakia, and probably also in a few other countries, you would see a solid reaction from the uh, public from the civil society actors, but a horrible reaction from the political level. <laughs> You're from Latvia, as far as I remember in Latvia, it's the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Culture, probably also Interior Ministry dealing with disinformation. We are nowhere close to that. We have like one team in the Ministry of Interior that is uh, 
of, often often attacked by by uh, the president Miloš Zeman, who, who is uh, the, the the master spreader of disinformation himself. Uh, the political will simply isn't here. So I think. In this regard, we are maybe a bit closer to Ukraine, where the reaction of state institutions also wasn't really good so far, but the reaction of the civil society was, was brilliant. And I think we are a bit closer to that than to, for example, uh, Latvia or, or Lithuania or, or even Sweden, where the reaction of the state authorities is also great. Katerina, is the Slovak government also quite passive in this regard? Um... We need to distinguish a few things because, I mean, um, to a certain level, I agree that there is still a lot of things that need to be done uh, and established uh, when it comes to Czech Republic and also uh, to Slovakia. But um, we have a new government. I mean, this is one of the things that really influenced also uh, and made a huge impact in Slovakia that uh, the COVID pandemic came um, <laughs> with a new government. I think that the first uh, cases of COVID-19 ap appeared uh, one week after elections and the new government was really thrown into the water uh, with the, the pandemic. So um, when it comes to their activities, I think that they are trying and think they, they are trying to do their best uh, within the limits of the pandemic and within the um, priorities. Um, um, but uh, one thing is that really uh, what they accomplished is that Slovakia um, since beginning with this year has a new defense and new uh, security strategy which is openly talking uh, about hybrid threats and disinformation. This is something that uh, previous governments have been neglecting and uh, you know we, we finally received and passed these uh, strategic documents because the oldest ones uh, were dating back to 2005 uh, so there's a huge jump uh, in that um, of perception of threat and understanding that we need to be really uh, talking uh, about hybrid threats and the impact of disinformation on our uh, society and building this uh, uh, resilience of, of public institutions. Um, but um, I would agree that there are still huge gaps and huge things that um, our public administration and our government uh, still can do. I mean, they're trying. I mean, um, at the moment, the new action plan on, well, the first action plan on hybrid threats uh, is being uh, composed. Uh, there's a, a coordination mechanism on uh, countering uh, disinformation is being established uh, and the structures are being established in Slovakia, but it just takes time because um, you know, the priority is the uh, pandemic, uh, but um, um, yes, in the, in the past we saw this Isles of Excellence. Uh, in our case, it was the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that uh, established the Stratcom uh, unit um, already back in 2017. And it was the only institution that had a, a Stratcom um, a doctrine and working document uh, and then, you know, you had this uh, few very active uh, public representatives of various uh, uh, ministries uh, that have been involved in, in fostering this topic. And with the new government, you really see the development and, and more activity of, for example, Ministry of Health when it comes to communication, uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Interior in these topics. Uh, but it is a continuous process uh, that have been uh, significantly eventually supported by the, the new government, uh, which came to place uh, uh, a year ago. Thank you. So we start to receive questions from our audience and Noel and Roger are asking um, about vulnerabilities. Uh, which part of society is the most susceptible to disinformation in terms of demographics or maybe some pre-established beliefs? Whoever feels comfortable to take that first. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, when it comes to uh, susceptibility and vulnerability of, of, of uh, let's say, age groups, um, we see that the, the older generations are most susceptible to particular uh, disinformation because of their uh, lack of, let's say, digital skills and understanding of social media 
uh, platforms and how they work and what kind of content they're amplifying. Um, but when it comes to Slovakia, you know, we, you have 65% of people or 60 people that believe in various conspiracy theories. So you cannot really say uh, that it's just one segment of the population. The belief in conspiracy theories in Slovakia is really, really widespread. Um, we see that people who have, uh, uh, let's say, um, elementary educations are much more vulnerable to particular disinformation. But again, it really depends on the type of the disinformation and conspiracy, uh, because you have conspiracy theories where even the university educated people that live in uh, Bratislava or and in the capital are susceptible to them. So it's very uh, hard to really pinpoint like who are the ones because that vulnerability really differs depending on the topic. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I know that Yaku wanted to say something as well, so I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. Actually, I, I will mostly just uh, repeat pretty much the same. Uh, I mean, one part of the trouble is that we do not really measure it properly. We do not have proper opinion polls that would tell us uh, what amount of people believe disinformation messages about COVID, about Ukraine, about MA17, about Syria, about the topics that the disinformers are, are exploiting. So unfortunately, we do not even have the, the big number, like how many of, of uh, how big part of the population are they? Uh, so, so we don't really have the population segments. Sometimes you would see like partial opinion polls that are focusing just one, on, on one question, one topic, um, they can give you some information. It seems that, uh, I mean, the, the intuitive presumption was that it will obviously be the less educated, the older generation living outside of capital. But it seems from some of the opinion polls that it's actually maybe even a bigger problem is in the mid-side cities, you know, something like five to 50,000 people. Not really that much in Prague and not really like complete villages. Uh, but but really the, the mid-sized cities seem to be seem to be the bigger trouble but again it's just uh, one opinion poll and as Katka mentioned among the spreaders of disinformation you would find people with a university degree currently during the pandemic we have one um, immunologist uh, brilliant scientist who's very visible but he's a notorious spreader of Kremlin's disinformation. He's one of the guys who thinks that, you know, Crimea has been Russian even before Russia was created. So um, uh, even university degree will not make you immune towards this. Uh, and then obviously when someone like that spreads it, he will find a huge audience uh, from his peers. <laughs> this is precisely uh, how, how the disinformation campaign works. So, it is evolving and unfortunately I'm a bit afraid that those who are organizing the disinformation campaign are two steps ahead from, from us who are trying to counter it because they really have much more experience uh, with uh, spreading their disinformation messages. Okay, now to the topic that probably is uh, on top of the head of many, uh, Sputnik V and its uh, influence on both Czech and um, Slovak government. Um, so maybe uh, first, Katerina, you can elaborate uh, what role idea of purchasing Sputnik V vaccines has played on, on the stability of Slovak government? Uh, well, our uh, government is experiencing at the moment a bit of a coalition crisis. So, I mean, it tells you uh, this is the impact of, of Sputnik uh, V uh, vaccine getting into Slovakia, uh, which actually the first bunch of the vaccine arrived on March uh, 1st. And um, yeah, so that's the impact. I mean, as simple as that. Uh, we're experiencing a bit of a, a coalition crisis and we'll see how that eventually works out. Um, and, and it is a bit of a... Um, unfortunate decision that um, uh, Russia is really utilizing this uh, dire situation in which Slovakia and now Czech Republic uh, is in because, I mean, the cases, uh, the numbers are really dire. I think that um, uh, now I, I believe the Czech Republic is, is leading 
the 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 world's data but a few weeks back it was slovakia that had the most uh, deaths uh, per population that had the most um, uh, people hospitalized in critical units uh, per population um, and um, it was utilized uh, by the kremlin who offered us uh, sputnik 5 and uh, basically politicians um, accepted it um, because of the dire situation because and because of of, of of the deaths that we were facing each day and uh, you could really see it that as soon as the the vaccine uh, came to slovakia i mean the administration hasn't really started i mean we're waiting for uh, the i think authorization by e ema and we need to check the vaccine itself uh, whether it's the correct uh, number um but um and we could see that as soon as got as soon as it got to Slovakia, uh, you know, you saw these uh, posts uh, and, and messages at RT saying that uh, Slovakia is the second European country that authorized uh, the vaccine in European Union, which was not true. Uh, then these uh, uh, fictional pollings appeared, where seventy four percent of Slovaks wanted to get vaccinated by Sputnik, which is not the case. Uh, and uh, yeah, they basically used Slovakia uh, and our situation to promote further their vaccine, uh, both in the world, but also towards their uh, population. Uh, how is situation different in Czech Republic? Is there any pressure and how that pressure on the person responsible for purchasing vaccines plays out? It's uh, it's actually evolving quite quickly. Just a few hours before before I joined your event, we had a new development. So the situation is that uh, the government, the Minister of Health and the head of the agency that is clearing all the medicine that comes into the Republic, all of them decline Sputnik V as untested, unreliable, uh, whatever. <laughs> and... Uh, we have one political actor who, who uh, lobbies for Sputnik, and unsurprisingly, it's Miloš Zeman, the president. So just today, he asked the prime minister uh, to kick out of the government uh, the minister of health and to also, uh, to also get rid of the head of the agency for, for, for the medicine. So, so he, he actually went like uh, in a full-scale fight just, just because of untested vaccine on behalf of the Russians. It's, it's not the first time that Miloš Zeman is, is uh, willing to go against the state institutions uh, in the interest of the Kremlin or China. He's doing it regularly, actually. He's been attacking the uh, internal intelligence service uh, for, because of their warnings against uh, Chinese and Russian espionage. Mm, and this is this is just another episode in this sad long series. Um, unfortunately, it is a horrible failure of our members of parliament and senators, who are the only ones who have the power to actually uh, get Miloš Zeman away from his position, where he is clearly acting on behalf of a foreign and hostile power. On top of that, do you also observe that uh, narrative that? Western vaccines are worse than Sputnik, creating additional pressure from the audience for the governments to purchase Sputnik V. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it, they, they are living in this Orwellian double thing where, you know, the pandemic doesn't exist, but it was created by the EU and vaccination is dangerous for you. But Sputnik is brilliant and will solve all your problems and probably also cure your depression. So, yeah, attacking Western vaccines, that's, that's kind of part of the game. Um, if it, if it does any difference in the information space, uh, it's really hard to say because the solid media, fortunately, are reporting quite solidly on this case, you know, highlighting that, for example, the Russians hadn't asked until very recently for the approval by the uh, EMA, the European Agency. Um, so the last opinion poll I saw, uh, people weren't that uh, in favor of Sputnik. On the other hand, um, you know, it is clear that the pro Kremlin side has their campaign and they have their speakers uh, and they know their audience, whereas the government is uh, uh, extremely poor in their communication efforts. Uh, you know, they, they promised a pro-vaccination campaign, 
to be launched in in uh, January, in February, in March. No, it's March, so so they announced it probably won't be in March. Yes, we can see that. Thank you. <laughs> so. Um, it, unfortunately, one side has a plan, the other doesn't. So I'm a bit afraid that this situation might deteriorate in, 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 in time. Hmm, thank you. Um, another question about trust in NATO. I already mentioned that finding that perception is that NATO is aggressive alliance that is provoking Russia. Um, so what in what way people are actually willing to accept nato in in the region what's the role of nato for those who don't think that nato is aggressive and how how is that the czech republic and slovakia are still members of of the nato no i mean um this is one of the things that our uh, public opinions polls really show that there are huge dichotomies uh uh, in the perceptions of either institutions um, or either um, democracies when it, you know, when it comes to Central and Eastern Europeans. And uh, this, these dichotomies are, um, you know, based on the disinformation that the support in, of, for NATO or for European Union is really not challenged in Central Europe. European Union, I mean, in Czech Republic is, is questionable because the Czechs are the most Eurosceptic, but when it comes to uh, people, people's willingness to stay in NATO, uh, that is, for example, actually increasing in Slovakia, and it has increased by 80% um, in the past four years. And we believe this is due to the fact that a lot of public institution eventually started to communicate, you know, the importance of NATO and what is... Uh, the membership of NATO mean for Slovakia and uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Defense or Armed Forces in Slovakia has been doing a really great job in this. So uh, the, the dichotomy in this is that uh, majority of people want to stay and they perceive uh, uh, NATO as an important, um, you know, security guarantor. Uh, majority of the people uh, think that NATO, you know, being in NATO means that they're living in a safer environment um, but the impact of these uh, disinformations uh, and impact of um, uh, some of the political leaders spreading disinformation about NATO is visible. And you can see it in these dichotomies and this belief in various conspiracy theories. Uh, for example, um, back in 2019, uh, there was this uh, public, um, you know, quarrel between two public institutions in Slovakia, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Defense at the time led by uh, Slovak uh, National Party. Um, and um, uh, at the time Slovakia was negotiating uh, a support uh, for, from the United States. Um, we were supposed to get some uh, several, several yeah, over hundred millions of dollars for uh, restoration of military facilities and uh, you know we had uh, members of um, ministry or minister itself uh, we had uh, members of parliament saying that if uh, Slovakia would get uh, this kind of money from the United States they would mean that um, <laughs> nuclear weapons are going to be stationed in Slovakia uh, and that, uh, you know, uh, foreign soldiers will be uh, stationed in Slovakia and Slovakia will become a target of a potential, um, you know, uh, attack from, from Russia. And you had, you know, really public institutions uh, saying this and on one hand, another public institution debunking it, saying it, that this is false. So, so this kind of confusion uh, and this kind of um, disinformation that is publicly voiced by um, you know, public representatives really resonates among people. And uh, when you have um, this kind of anti-NATO narratives and disinformation being spread systematically since the annexation of Crimea in Slovakia or in wider region, then you, you really cannot, uh, you know, the people's mind do not really change uh, that fast. Um, so this is the impact of the dichotomies. I mean, Russia, uh, NATO is perceived 
as as a stabilizer uh, but then you know these narratives are really still there and are in creating this dichotomies and perceptions and a uh, short question uh, if you could be concise um, Nikolai from the audience is asking what's the common political sentiment uh, of citizens in your countries uh, about Ukraine maybe just briefly is it something that people are divided upon or people are unified in their attitude towards uh, current political vector uh, of Ukraine meaning quite anti-Russian and um, yeah um, the official public representatives really support uh, Ukraine and, uh, you know, uh, do not perceive that Ukraine uh, has been somehow divided uh, and believe that the eastern part of Ukraine are still part of the Ukraine and that's the official politics of, uh, of Slovakia. Uh, however, um, the uh, pro-Russian or Kremlin disinformation narratives have been really successful um, so I believe about 40%, we did this polling back in 2018, so I don't, uh, I don't really recall the numbers correctly, but I believe it was around 40% uh, of, of Slovaks uh, that thought that Ukraine was actually responsible for the, the conflict uh, in Eastern Ukraine uh, back at that time. Uh, and uh, you really have a, a lot of um, disinformation outlets that, that have been really uh, streamlining uh, the, the the Sputnik uh, or Kremlin narratives uh, about this, uh, about, um, you know, MH17. So, so it really resonates among the people. Um, then the, the problem uh, why Slovakia is also much more vulnerable to this kind of disinformation is the fact that uh, Russia and this um, either, you know, domestic actors are playing on this pan-Slavic unity that has been resonating in Slovakia for centuries. I mean, this idea of, of pan-Slavic unity uh, of, of you know, Slavic countries and Slovakia to uh, uh, Russia uh, dates back to uh, 19th century uh, when Slovakia was fighting for its independence within Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, and at that time, you know, we developed this uh, this pan-Slavic unity uh, and image of Russia that is going to save us because we have this common culture, common language, uh, which, um, to be honest, is there, but but it's not existent to such an extent. And this this uh, this pan-Slavic unity and ideas uh, of it has been utilized uh, for decades by um, USSR but uh, even now by the Russian Federation. And, uh, you know, um, on average, 78% um, uh, of Slovaks think that uh, Russia is our um, Slavic brother. And uh, they are actively spreading messages that are, are utilizing this narrative and playing on the, the emotions and history. Thank you, Katerina. We have uh, about 12 minutes left. Uh, so I have one big question and one closing question. Um, the big question is, and here I basically reference to Lisa's and Yuxel's question. Uh, Lisa is talking about fear-based narratives that are being amplified and basically enforcing each other, while um, Yuxel is talking about the role of social media platforms. And also there is a question, uh, what role should uh, big tech pla platforms play to help Czech and Slovak governments fight disinformation and probably social and political divide in the society? Maybe Jakub. Um, let me start with the, let me start with the platforms. Um, the current debate about the role of uh, players like Facebook or Twitter, I have to admit it is, it is slightly depressing for me, not only in the Czech Republic, but also in Brussels. It's almost as if these uh, actors were the main culprit, the main perpetrator, the main aggressor. And that is, that is not true. Uh, they are a channel. They are an abused channel. Obviously, they could be doing more to protect themselves against being 
abused, but they are not the aggressor here. In 2013, we thought that Facebook uh, is the main exporter of democracy after the Arab Spring. Suddenly, people are accusing Facebook of destroying democracy. Apparently, it's just a vehicle. Uh, I'm not saying it's 100% neutral, but it's, it is a little bit like uh, you can use a knife to, to feed yourself and you can use a knife to kill a person. <laughs> you can use Facebook to spread democracy. You can use Facebook to undermine democracy. But that's just a statement of the person behind the campaign. Um, so I'm, I'm slightly depressed that we are making them bigger criminals than they, than they really are. Uh, I think we should ask them to do the same. We, we ask from, for example, the media, who are also one of the channels through which disinformation spreads. And in most of our countries, there are certain laws regulating what TV uh, or newspaper can, can spread. We don't have these rules for digital platforms, and I think we will have them one day. Uh, it is necessary. Uh, the unregulated environment simply doesn't work. But it doesn't mean that they are the aggressors here. So um, I would probably consider them more like a partner rather than an enemy. You know, we, we didn't defeat the Nazi propaganda by destroying radio stations, and we didn't fight Soviet propaganda by fighting TV companies. We shouldn't be fighting the current infodemic by attacking social media. We should be uh, taking them as a partner who can help us. And they could be doing more. They could be doing significantly more. For example, labeling the notorious disinformation-oriented outlets. They could stop recommending the, you know, it was, uh, I believe, in 2018 when Guillaume Chasselot was, was uh, doing the investigations about YouTube and how they recommend uh, notorious disinformation-oriented uh, outlets in the recommended videos. You search for Mueller report on YouTube and, and you get a result from Russia Today. So that's obviously wrong. Uh, they shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> we should be asking them to do more in this regard, but I don't think we should be fighting against them. Thank you. Katarina? I have to agree with Jakub that, uh, you know, we shouldn't be, um, you know, social media platforms, especially Facebook, because Facebook is the most dominant social media platform in Czech Republic and Slovakia, where majority of disinformation is being spread in our countries. Uh, you know, they're not our enemies, but I would really stress uh, at the same time that they really, 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 really need to step up uh, their actions. Uh, one of the things that we have been observing for several years now is uh, that uh, these platforms are um, really unable to enforce their own rules and principles in small markets as uh, Slovakia or Czech Republic is, uh, because the fact that these people do not have uh, enough of native speakers working for them uh, who understand the uh, domestic situation. Um, you know, at the moment, for example, there's one uh, I mean, one person, uh, not one organization, one person uh, being a, an in independent fact checker for Facebook uh, that covers the whole over 3 million uh, market uh, uh, for Facebook. And that is just, you know, that's not possible to do uh, for one person, especially when you take, when you take into consideration that there are over 1,800 uh, various Facebook pages and groups that are actively spreading disinformation. Uh, so um, yes, uh, platforms, social media platforms need to be our partners, but they really need to step up their efforts uh, when, when it comes to not only in small countries, uh, but uh, uh, their focus uh, needs to be on the fact that the rules and principles need to be enforce equally, no matter how big uh, the market uh, is. Um, yeah, and um, when it comes to the, the question about the, the fear narratives, this is something that already Jakub mentioned in the beginning. I mean, that's a principle uh, why those disinformation and conspiracy theories really resonate among the people because they ignite the fear. And this is what we see in our polling that uh, in both our countries, uh, some of the political parties, um, even mainstream political parties, but also far-right extremists and anti-system parties have based their uh, political campaigns on, on fear, um, for example, fear of migrants. 
And this really, really has resonated among the people. Uh, last year, we had a question in our polling, you know, um, and we found out that 72% of Czechs and Slovaks think that uh, migrants threaten their values and uh, traditions. And Slovakia and Czech Republic are not really, you know, the target uh, countries uh, of, of uh, migration and never have been even during the, the migration crisis. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, these kind of like fearful campaigns or disinformation really aiming at fear uh, lead to huge polarization um, um, within our societies and can have uh, long-term effects despite of the fact that they might not be based on reality. Uh, and um, there has been actually one really, really uh, nice case in, in Czech Republic. I don't remember the name of this retired gentleman, but there was a case a few years ago when a retired gentleman, a follower of uh, um, this politician that based his career on anti-migrant campaign, he he uh, cut down two times uh, trees on uh, train tracks, uh, attempting to derelay, uh, you know, those trains that have supposedly, that were supposedly bringing millions and millions of migrants uh, to, to Czech Republic, to Europe. Uh, and he tried to blame it on the Muslims uh, because, uh, you know, um, at the, you know, he, he, he spread various pamphlets saying, you know, praising Allah at the, at, at the place uh, where he cut down those trees. And he was sent to jail uh, because he believed in these conspiracy theories. And this is a retired uh, gentleman uh, of, I believe, over 70 years old. So he might actually die in the jail. So I don't know how, what's the after effect of, of this in the Czech Republic, Jaku, but um, uh, yeah, this, this fear, fearful narrative really resonating with the people. Thank you. Thank you both. We have four minutes left, so I will try to package the last question so it smoothly wraps up and also ends on more kind of positive note. So um, solutions. Uh, you talked about how we should c collaborate with the platforms, uh, but also how we should uh, how should our partners like EU and NATO help in um, in basically fighting this information situation? What more could uh, EU and NATO do on a more centralized level to basically counter this information situation, not only in Central Eastern Europe, but in other places as well? Um, yeah, what are your views? My favorite topic, and we have just two minutes left, that's, that's a bit unfair. Um, I frequently talk about a four lines of defense model, uh, where I think we could be doing significantly more in each of the four lines. The first one is documenting. We have to be documenting the cases of disinformation in time so that we know where a narrative started, so that we know that the Czech pro-Kremlin websites are just copy-pasting what appeared last week uh, on Kisilyov's show. And uh, we try to do that with the EU versus disinfo campaign for the pro-Kremlin disinformation campaign. However, we would need this for the Chinese disinformation campaign. We would need these for European spreaders like Viktor Orban. I mean, well, the trouble is we are f currently documenting only the pro-Kremlin sources, which is a majority, I don't doubt that, but it's, it's not everything. The second line of defense is uh, raising awareness about the threat. Here again, we are not doing enough. Uh, the, some of the governments have their communication products, some of them don't, some of them leave it up to the civil society somewhere. The civil society is actually not active at all, uh, for example, in Germany. So we could be doing significantly more in this regard. Third line of defense I call repairing the weaknesses of the information space, and that might be the dividing lines that the disinformers exploit, like those between the older and younger generation, the uh, more literate and less literate, more educated, less educated, but also space like information, information space like social media platforms. Uh, these are the weaknesses that the disinformers are exploiting and we need to strengthen them. And finally, uh, and I, I think we will, never, we will never win unless we start employing this fourth line of defense much more often. That's actually punishing and limiting and deterring the information aggressors. 
again, the Baltic states are a brilliant example of that. Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, all of them are using already existing laws about inciting hatred, inciting violence, uh, undermining statehood of a country. We, can, we could be using these laws much more often because when, when we have a look at what the information aggressors are spreading, it is inciting hatred, it is inciting violence, it is spreading fear. Um, we have a law for spreading false alarm messages. You can't call fire in a theater. So we could be using these laws and sanctions against the disinformers much more often. And it, we would make it clear that we do not tolerate this behavior. The trouble with not punishing actors like Russia means that new actors arise and China is learning from the Russians very diligently. And once they use the Russian know-how with the Chinese resources, we have a really big problem. Uh, unfortunately, time is up. So um, thank you very much for your time and very insightful discussion. I learned a lot also about domestic case studies I wasn't aware of. And uh, for the rest of us, Let's meet uh, next week uh, on March 17, when um, we will present report about coordinated online harassment of Finnish government ministers. Not only, uh, say, civilians are being um, harassed, but also uh, ministers, and um, it's, it's taking a um, larger scale than we would ideally anticipate. Thank you very much for your uh, time and uh, have a good evening or the day, depending on where you are located. Good night.